Today's reading is taken from John chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. It can be found in page 1063 in the Red Church Bible, 1063. Before we read, let us pray to our Father in heaven. Our gracious Lord, we give you thanks for not only making yourself known to us through your word, but the word himself became flesh to lead us directly to you. Your word is living and we can experience it every day. So please, Lord, give us a tender and teachable heart as we receive your words today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Thanks so much, Charlotte, and let me uh, add my welcome. Um, I love that sort of uh, feeling of relative peace that comes across this building at about uh, 10 o'clock each Sunday morning as the children go off to their groups and activities to have a wonderful time learning together from the Bible, and uh, there's this kind of calm that just kind of comes about uh, in here. And uh, so we're going to reflect for a few minutes on these verses that we've just had read from John's Gospel. So um, do keep them open or get them open, because uh, it would be great if you're able to follow along. And uh, there's a few um, Johns that we just need to get straight at the start. Um, I'm John, and uh, it's uh, lovely to have you here. Um, but there's some other Johns that we need to know about as well. There's the John that got mentioned in our reading. Um, that's not me. It's a different John. John the Baptist um, is uh, one of the figures who was um, related to Jesus and who announced Jesus' coming. And uh, we read about him here. And he's different to the John whose name is at the top of uh, this uh, page here. Um, because uh, John the Baptist met an untimely end. But uh, John, who wrote this gospel, this account of Jesus' life, um, lived with Jesus, uh, spent time with him day by day, uh, watched him through his whole life, and wrote down uh, this account for us. Uh, and so he's the John that we really want to listen to uh, this morning. And we're just going to dig into the first few verses, really, of this account and as we do so, I just want us to think for a moment, what would make a, a really good Christmas for you this year and for your um, household? Um, is it perhaps about the people uh, enjoying a Christmas film together, uh, out for a crisp uh, afternoon walk, um, telling each other those cheesy jokes from the Christmas crackers gathered around the table? Or is it more about the, the food for you? Uh, turkey and all the trimmings, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, mince pies, mulled wine, we've got them coming later, not the sprouts, the, the pies and wine. Um, perhaps something more international than the traditional uh, British menu for Christmas Day. 
Uh, or for some of us, it might be the presents, um, getting that gadget you've been waiting for for ages, uh, trying on a new outfit, uh, seeing the kids' faces when they open their presents. Uh, for many, if we can uh, just push on through the busyness and exhaustion of December, Christmas uh, is a time of love and, and life and light. Now, obviously, it's never perfect. Um, Aunt Ethel falls out with Cousin Jim. Uh, the roast ends up uh, overcooked and dry. You put on a, a brave face at uh, the jumper your sister gave you. Uh, but still, Christmas can be an oasis of love and life and light. In a world that does often feel like it's full of uh, division and death and, and darkness. Plastered across our screens, instead of loving relationships, there can be loneliness, um, arguments and fear. Um, I understand that Women's Aid sees a 15% increase in calls to its domestic abuse helpline uh, just after Christmas. And if we have problems with those who are present at Christmas, we also feel the impact of those who are absent. Feelings of grief can creep up on us and catch us by surprise at times. And the darkness and despair can dominate uh, and all this before we look further afield at the desperate situations of poverty and, and sickness and war that fill our screens. So the glimmers and, and glimpses of love and life and light that we get at Christmas, I think they're a bit like pointers, signposts to a deeper uh, love and life and light. And I'd like to share with you uh, just briefly this morning how the origins of Christmas take us into that love and life and light. Now, we, like, uh, we think of the origins of Christmas, that they lie 2,000 years ago, uh, in the birth of Jesus of Nazareth um, in a small province within the Roman Empire. We know uh, that story about Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem and the shepherds and the wise men. But our reading from John chapter 1 takes us somewhere else, as you've noticed, no doubt. Many people recognize it as the uh, ninth and climactic reading from that classic service of nine lessons and nine carols. And so John is one of these um, biographies that we've got of Jesus' life, but he starts somewhere very different to the others. He's an eyewitness to what Jesus said and did, but he's writing about things that are, go on far before he was ever around. Now, he wrote these things down so that we can know Jesus for ourselves, that's what he says when he gets to the end of his account of Jesus' life. But we're looking at the opening words of Jesus' account today, and it, it gives us the backstory, as it were, to the events of Bethlehem and Nazareth. It, it looks past the prophet Isaiah, that reading that we opened the service with. He lived about 700 BC. But before that, in fact, John is painting Jesus on a, on a cosmic canvas. So look down at verse 1 with me. You see where John goes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So it's like we're invited to rewind all the way back through history, right to the very beginning, before anything had happened before the universe was there, before absolutely everything, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So we've got these two uh, characters, as it were, there at the beginning. There's the Word, who was God, and there's God himself. Now, you might say that he's a bit like the speaker of the word. Now, does this all sound a bit weird and crazy? I sort of acknowledge that it's a bit beyond what we might normally think of at this time on a Sunday morning. It gets more weird. There's actually a third person, the Holy Spirit, but we'll, we'll leave that for just now. Just focus on what's here in John 1. The word is John's way of speaking about Jesus before he was born, before he came to us as a human being. You'll remember from uh, our full reading of the chapter earlier that the word is also called the one and only Son who came from the Father, uh, the one who became flesh and who was born to live among us that first Christmas. And what John's saying to us is that Jesus, the word, he is 
fully God. He was there at the beginning. He was with God and he was God. Now that is a massive claim for a little baby that was born in a backwater in the land of Israel 2,000 years ago. That he was also the eternal son of God. The one who'd always existed. Now we've got a toddler at home. Um, cute, slightly crazy, as toddlers are. <laughs> Imagine me saying that she was actually around before Queen Elizabeth II. Or saying that she was around before Queen Elizabeth I. Well, that's kind of like what the Bible is claiming for Jesus here. Only on a far, far bigger scale. And why does John call him the Word? Well, I was um, doing my um, PhD here in, in Cambridge... Um, I was asked to give a class on this topic. Now, don't worry, I'm not about to launch into that 50-minute lecture on all the details. Um, but let's just say, uh, in the context of first-century Jewish monotheism and Greco-Roman philosophical debates, that what John wrote was absolutely explosive. The word, the, the logos, was the Jewish way of describing God's speech and also the Hellenistic way of articulating uh, the sort of the rational basis of the universe, how it works. Uh, perhaps the best way of expressing it is, is simply that the word of God is how God makes everything and also how God makes himself known. His speech reveals his character and nature. And Jesus is that speech, that word, God's way of making himself known known to us. So if we want to know what God's like, what the ultimate reality of this universe that we live in, how do we make sense of it all? Well, the answer is we listen to Jesus. And this shows us what lies right at the very heart of the universe, of our lives, of absolutely everything. Now, I know that for some people, um, our existence is just about random chance, some chemical reactions that turn out well for a a few decades, hopefully. Uh, for others, the universe is uh, built on a kind of raw power, uh, an arbitrary, decisive, unitary force where all are ultimately subject to the strongest. For Christians, there's something really quite different at the heart of the universe. Not that random chance or, or brute power, but love. The love of a father for a son and a son for his father. The love of a God who makes himself known to us in his word. A God of relationship who's already, who has always existed in eternal relationship of love and who reaches out to us so that we can know him and he can know us. A God who wants to know you and to speak to you and to share his love with you and me. This is one of the things I love about being a Christian. Um, I did a maths degree as an undergraduate, um, so I like things to make sense, to add up, as it were. It was while I was here as a student and a young adult that I, I really made sense of the Bible and Christian faith. I read the whole Bible through several times and asked loads of questions. I argued with my friends about faith and the meaning of life. And again and again, I found that the answers that Jesus gave make sense. They were coherent. They were attractive. They made sense of life and the world. And best of all, they provided a solid basis for life. Now, I still have questions. We all do. And and my children have questions too. They're so good at making me think. But here's the thing. I'm, I'm so glad that there is a God of love. A God who speaks and makes himself known. Right at the heart of the universe. And Christmas shows us that love in a fresh way. As the eternal son of God, who's always existed, shrinks himself and becomes this tiny baby in his mother's arms. Now, I, I know I said I wouldn't give you the, the full lecture, so we should move on from love to think about the other two themes that come out here, life and light. 
They're probably a bit simpler to explain, which should help us too. So what about life? Christmas shows us life in fresh ways. Uh, And again, John takes us back uh, beyond Christmas, back to the origins of the universe, in fact. Um, This is how he puts it down in verse 3. Have a a glance down at that with me. Verse 3. Through him, through, through the word, through Jesus, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word, remember that's Jesus before he was born. He was there at the beginning, we saw just now. He was involved in the creation of the universe. Now, science loves to puzzle over the origins of everything. Some wonderfully uh, amazing minds that work on these things. Uh, And I'm not going to dig into the, the Bible's accounts of creation Today, it's a topic for another time, but the the basic claim is that Jesus, the Word, the Son of God, is the source of all life, of all things, of absolutely everything. Even if we're not totally clear on how that all works, that's the claim here. So, all the good things that we enjoy at Christmas find their origin in that original creative activity, whether it's food and drink, gadgets or outfits, toys or travels, everything can be traced back ultimately to God's creation. Everything that's beautiful, uh, the sunset over the river Cam, the majesty of the mountains slightly further away, the, uh, the mystery of the oceans and the outer space, all of it comes from the mind of God through the word of God. And remember, this is the God who wants us to know him. And this gives the Christian a basic posture of thankfulness. This world is a gift from a loving creator. Our food and homes and clothes and stuff, it all comes to us as a gift. Music and singing, all part of the amazing creation through Jesus. And perhaps most basic of all, life itself. Not something to take for granted In him was life. I suppose you could think of it at one level as the the animating force, the spark of energy. But it's more than that. It's an invitation into the life of the living God. A way to know him. To know his eternal joy and creativity and beauty for ourselves. And it's a life that is stronger than death. A life that begins now, and here's the amazing offer, if we receive it from Jesus, a life that actually will go on forever. There's something marvelous about holding a newborn baby. I still remember it well when our firstborn arrived. So small, so sweet. Around this church family, we've had the privilege of, I think, about 15 born uh, this year. And it's wonderful to see the church family gather around the new parents to celebrate with them, uh, support them. Uh, Here in our midst is new life, growing up, coming to know Jesus for themselves and getting to share in his eternal life. And this eternal life is so precious uh, at the other end of life too, in the sadness of bereavement. In the past year, we bid farewell to our oldest church member, Timothy, He would have been 98 this coming Christmas. And he'll be much missed by all those who knew and loved him. But even though he's no longer with us, we also know that he's not dead in any ultimate sense. He's alive with the Lord Jesus. And one day, he'll be given a new body. And he'll be able to enjoy God's perfect new world. Now, some might say this is just wishful thinking fairy tales. But the fact is, it's rooted in the life of Jesus, the one man who has come back from the dead to show us that he has beaten death. And this kind of life is only found in him, the one who is the source of life in the beginning and at the end. So yes, death is real. It's a monster. It's an intruder into God's good creation. But it doesn't get the last word. Jesus gets the last word. In him was life, as John put it. And that life was the light of all 
mankind. Uh, which takes us nicely onto that third and, and final theme from our uh, passage this morning light. Verse 5 The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, next uh, Sunday evening, we've got our Carols by Candlelight service. It's lovely, all the lights off, the candles all around the place. It's lovely on a, on a dark winter's evening to have that kind of glow of light and warmth. Because the reality is this time of year, and, and as we look around the world, this world can feel very dark sometimes. It's on the news, but it's also in our lives, isn't it? The hurt, the, the broken relationships, the disappointments and despair. Sometimes it feels like we come face to face with the darkness in particular ways. And this time of year, I know, can feel particularly bleak for some. There's darkness out there and often around us too. And part of the problem is that there's also a kind of darkness that, that's inside of us that we can't just get rid of by flicking a light switch on. Those times when we feel the weight of it, when we, when we hurt those we love, when we mess up and do the wrong thing, when we fail to maintain even our own standards, perhaps worst of all, when we choose to ignore God and hope that he's not really there or that interested in our lives, and we end up being those who spread darkness ourselves, and we become, as it were, part of the problem. This is why Christmas Day can get so fraught, isn't it? You put a group of people together who've got this kind of internal inclination towards darkness, and it's hardly surprising when problems soon erupt. The, the resentment, the frustration, the arguments, the, the basic human reality is true of each and every one of us, and that includes Christians. Some people think that Christians are people who've got their lives sorted, uh, and who are basically good-hearted people. Um, let me just say, that's so not true. I'm a vicar. I get to know the church family. It's not true. And I know myself as well. And I've sat and listened as people have poured out the pain of conflict at home. I've, I've walked alongside those grappling with deep temptation and struggles. I've, I've seen the ways that we can hurt each other. And as I said, I'm no different to anyone else in this church. I'm also part of the problem. Just because we're all smiley here wearing our Christmas jumpers on a Sunday morning doesn't alter the fact that, that we as Christians are so aware of the darkness ourselves. I suppose one difference for Christians is that we've tried to face up to the darkness inside. Uh, we've said to God, look, God, I've got this problem. I know you call it sin. And I need your help. And that's where Jesus so wonderfully uh, steps into our lives to bring hope. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. And it gets even better. The darkness has not overcome that light. Jesus is the light that, that chases away every darkness. The, the way that he brings forgiveness for all the dark things that weigh us down. He brings a, a, a fresh start, a bright new beginning, a, a real lasting hope. So the, the Christmas adverts, uh, they're kind of uh, becoming a bit of a thing, aren't they, at this time of year? Been out for a month or so. I don't know which ones have captured your attention um, this year. Um, Coca-Cola generated theirs entirely using AI. That feels very 2020s, doesn't it? Um, Waitrose went for a whodunit mystery. Um, not quite to rival the, the genius of BBC's Ludwig with all its um, lovely scenes set around Cambridge. John Lewis, did you see that one? Outrageous setting for their advert. An actual John Lewis store. They weren't on the moon this year. They're breaking the mould there. Their advert is actually all about shopping as well. Their punchline's great. The secret to finding the perfect gift is knowing where to look. Well, John Lewis, you'll be able to get lots of stuff there. Um, I, I, it's a perfect gift for a preacher as well, isn't it? I hope it won't surprise you if I take that line into our carol service this morning and suggest that there's a more perfect gift than the one you can get from John Lewis today. Jesus wants to bring his light into our lives. And his light is far brighter than the darkness. I'd love to say more about how Christmas leads on to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, but our time is nearly gone. I'd just encourage you to come back, hear more about this good news, 
um, or read on through John's account of Jesus. Uh, we've got some uh, copies of that we'd love to give you on the way out. Um, and there are various ways you can find out more because ultimately I'd love you to have the same experience that I've had and that Christians here have had of coming to realize that Jesus is true and real and worth believing and following. Christians are people who've received Jesus into our lives, right? At the center. Such that Jesus, the, the Word, He shapes and directs us. In a world that's so full of division and death and darkness, Jesus is the place where we can find love and life and light. So this Christmas time, Jesus comes down to us to offer himself as a gift, the perfect gift for each and every one of us. Let me lead us in a prayer. God, our Father, you know the thought of all of our hearts and minds. You know our hopes. You know the things that we're anxious about. And in this world that is so full of division and death and darkness, we thank you so much that Jesus comes as the one who brings love and life and light. For those of us who know him, help us to appreciate afresh the reality of who he is and what he brings today. And for those of us who are still um, exploring, still asking questions, still wondering what it's all about, please would you bring to each one of us your love and life and light this Christmas time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.